Hello, everyone, and welcome back. So I hope you had a good weekend. I guess you've seen that my uh, terrible time management oops, has resulted in um, there being no homework this weekend. Uh, I suppose you won't hate me for that. Um, but there will be homework uh, today. I have something in mind, and I'll, uh, I'll fill in on the details later. OK, so the plan for uh, today oops, is the following. Tech failures, one after the other. Oops. Let's see. Is this any better? Plan for today is to talk about uh, the role of theory. We sort of briefly touched on this before. Um, but we didn't really dive into it much. Uh, um, I'd like to do that today. And if we're very efficient with time, I want to go over lit reviews. Uh, so let's let's see how we do. By the way, before I start, any sort of questions or uh, feedback or things that you're um, worried about or questions about last week's lecture? Okay, hearing none, uh, let's let's move on. So we're gonna talk about the role of theory first. Um, and this is maybe not the most obvious um, topic for so computer science research, at least traditionally, but I, I will try to convince you by the end of uh, the lecture today that, um, that this actually makes a lot of sense for computer science research. Um, to Remind you, if you haven't been with us before, if you want to see me on the big screen, you have to pin my little thumbnail video in the gallery view, and that will make it bigger. Um, so if you haven't sort of, uh, seen that from, from previous lectures, that's the way to, to do that. Hopefully, you can still hear me. Mike's OK? OK. Um, so here, let's go through a use case. So this is uh, Stu. Uh, Stu is so nine months into his life for his PhD, depending on how you count. Um, and uh, he's working on uh, building some AI to generate programming source codes from natural language. That's sort of his research topic. Uh, and he's built this tool that does this, that takes natural language as input and generates source code as output. So people don't have to you know, type programs anymore uh, and needs to have a, needs, needs an evaluation plan for this tool, right? It's getting ready to submit a paper, but needs to evaluate this tool before he can do that. So I think, I think you'll find the scenario quite recognizable for, for many of you that are sort of, uh, tool, tool builders or, or uh, working on building systems. Okay, so here's what so Stu came up with after thinking about this a little bit. Stu thought that the best way to evaluate this tool is through a controlled experiment. So in a lab setting, in a control setting, and he has built an IDE plugin, a plugin for his uh, for for uh, integrated development editors for for people to use this uh, uh, AI that he has built within their editors, um, and he has thought to measure uh, a number of variables. So um, he's trying to uh, sort of compare two groups of of users of, of programmers those that are using this technology uh, versus those that are writing code from scratch. And he sort of is trying to evaluate the, the usefulness or the value of this kind of technology through this comparative study in a lab setting, in a control setting. Okay. Um, he's so measuring a bunch of dependent variables, um, whether the uh, tasks are correct, the programs that people write are correct, how quickly they write them, uh, so how efficient are people at the uh, finishing their tasks or programming. Uh, and also he's uh, collecting subjective uh, assessments of using this uh, uh, plugin, this assistant. The, to do this, he designed a bunch of uh, programming tasks. He thought very uh, carefully about this, looked at some sort of programming courses, intro to programming and so on, and came up with sort of a good array of tasks to evaluate this. Uh, different kinds of programming tasks that have to do with, I don't know, basic, basic Python things, uh, ranging all the way from that to, I don't know, more advanced data science or machine learning or visualization things that you could do with Python. Um, and he has uh, recruited a number of computer science graduate students to participate in this uh, study. And, um, he has a number of hypotheses that he uh, is looking to test through this study. And, for example, uh, he expects that code written using this uh, natural language to code plugin 
is more often correct than code written from scratch because so if he assumes the model is so sort of well trained and so on, the AI is smart and is able to produce uh, good code, correct code, whereas people might make mistakes, especially if they're more uh, sort of less experienced with programming, which is kind of the target audience here. Another hypothesis is that uh, people using the plugin complete their tasks faster on average than when they have to write code from scratch because you know, presumably they get all of this code for free. They just sort of describe using natural language what they're trying to do and they get all this code for free. They don't have to type it anymore. Um, and um, finally, he hypothesizes that people prefer to use the code snippets uh, produced by this uh, AI, this plugin, uh, overwriting code from scratch, just because it's, sort of, it's I guess he expects that uh, this would make people more productive. Okay, so far, any thoughts on this? As a design, seems reasonable. Hearing none, I'll just assume that you agree that this is maybe a reasonable uh, sort of study plan for evaluating this tool. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so Stu does this uh, and to everyone's surprise, um, all hypotheses were rejected. The data collected from the study um, does not uh, support any of the hypotheses. Uh, and in fact, people found using the plugin to be uh, unintuitive. They didn't enjoy doing it, uh, didn't enjoy using this. Um, side note, true story. Uh, I don't know if Frank is on the, um, on the call right now, but so this is a very literally, a very closely uh, uh, resembling a study that uh, so Frank just did uh, very, very recently. So you can read all the technical details uh, in the link over there. Okay. So, also true story that none of the hypotheses were, uh, were supported, right? all were rejected in Frank's study as well as uh, this example here. Okay, so what happened? It's hard to say without knowing what the experiments were actually. I mean, the hypotheses are more questions but it's not clear how they were attempted to be answered. So, so data was collected, those variables that I mentioned there um, were collected. So. Um, two groups of, of um, participants and conditions randomly assigned to one of the conditions, or that was important, I forgot to mention that, people were randomly assigned to, to one of these conditions. Um, and they had to complete a number of different tasks um, and those variables on um, correctness and speed and their uh, subjective impressions of using the tool were collected from the study and then some statistics were used uh, presumably appropriately to draw conclusions from that. Uh, the students, I, I don't, not really sure about what, H1, but H2 and H3 might be because the students aren't used to using the tool. Um, and uh, maybe they're rejected because the students uh, didn't like have, felt like they didn't have enough competency with the tool to make a proper assessment whether mm -hmm. they could do it faster, they're writing it from scratch or um, whether they prefer using it from scratch. Like maybe if they had more time to learn the tool than just in the, the controlled experiment, the results might be different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, that's a good point. What, what, what other thoughts do you have about this? From my perspective, the most obvious answer or hypothesis might be that the algorithm of this IDE or the quality of this IDE is simply not that good. Mm -hmm. Not good enough to surpass the human's ability to write code. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about why they found it unintuitive or what was mentioned? Uh, I, was there any open-ended feedback for this? There was um, for the specific study that uh, I mentioned, um, the, um, the main reason why people found it unintuitive is because it sort of required some special syntax to um, write these natural language queries. Uh, the plugin was trying to maybe be too smart and was trying to um, 
reuse uh, variables and whatnot that were being referenced within the input query as part of the output that it generates so that you sort of get them back in place and, and things like that. Uh, but this sort of added one layer of syntactic complexity to, to writing these queries in the first place. It's sort of, it was less natural than sort of just what you would type random keywords in Google, for example. That sounds like a problem. <laughs> so I wanted to add on to uh, Jenna's point, which was great. Um, I was wondering how much uh, training did the um, participants have on the new tool? Um, because yeah, if they haven't had any experience doing like using the tool, it would also be an interesting seeing like um, if NL2 code is actually easy to pick up as well, which could be another research question. Mm -hmm. um, so to your specific question, thanks, Kyle. Um, they uh, people had some sort of training as part of the study. They were they had to sort of follow some tutorial and they had some sort of training warm up tasks that they had to do before starting on the real ones. So you know that was sort of meant to give people some some experience, hopefully enough with with using this. But point taken, it's it's likely that they were just not comfortable enough uh, using this by the end of the training session, uh, as they've indicated in their uh, subjective assessments. So I guess I guess what you're seeing here is that. Um, you know, while on the surface, right, this seems like a pretty reasonable, arguably, uh, study design. In fact, probably more more reasonable than many. It was sort of a controlled, uh, controlled study in a lab setting with randomized assignment and so on. So it's sort of very close to what you would want to do if if you could do something like this. Um, so while on the surface this was very reasonable, there were sort of all kinds of, uh, I guess, implicit assumptions and and things going on here. Um, that the, the devil's in the details, as they say, right? So that we sort of, I didn't really cover as part of this, this exposition. Um, and this is actually a part of a, you know, a, a bigger set of uh, threats to the validity of, of any study. Um, you could think of, for example, uh, this very notion of correctness, right? How is that measured? Was that a subjective assessment according to some uh, you know, human uh, grader? Was that sort of automated test cases? Was it something else? Uh, and, and so on. Like how was speed measured? Like what if people took breaks and whatnot, right? So they were, uh, I don't know, maybe they, they stopped to check their phones or uh, get water or something, right? So you know, was that factored in? Things like this, right? So lots of sort of details that I didn't talk about, right? That could affect the measurement itself. Um, and all of these kinds of, of threats have to do with the it's called construct validity, the validity of the things you're, you're measuring. Uh, so that's sort of one big set of things that could have gone wrong. Um, another, right, familiarity with the plugin. You mentioned this. This sort of has to do with you know, internal validity. Uh, the, the experiment itself is um, only internally valid uh, if, so if, if people were so sufficiently familiar with the, the plugin so that you can actually uh, test the thing you're thinking you're testing as opposed to just observing their lack of familiarity. Um, right, the, the tasks themselves, we didn't really talk about this, like were they uh, tasks representative? Uh, were the people representative? So I mentioned the study subjects were maybe grad students. Um, like what population were these grad students representative of? So how, how far can we stretch the conclusions from uh, from the study. If we are observing this effect or lack thereof on this uh, sample of grad students, does that mean that if we were to try this out with real programmers, we should expect to see the same uh, the same outcome, the same results? So it's, it's not clear, right? So you know, are, are grad students the same as professional programmers, and and so on and so forth? Like lots of these sort of questions that have to do with the generalizability. Uh, of the results of the study. And, and this is referred to as, as external validity. How far can we um, extrapolate the findings of the study to other settings, other contexts, other populations, other whatever tools and so on. Um, so that's another class of threats here. Um, oh, it could also be sort of, the, so th this is referred to as theoretical reliability. Uh, the fact that the subjects knew that this tool uh, was Stu's own tool, and they were sort of trying to be nice to Stu. Uh, they were all his, uh, I don't know, CMU colleagues or something. Um, and um, 
you know, maybe they behave differently knowing that this was uh, their friend's tool as opposed to this being just some, some uh, third party tool and so on. So lots of these things that we could talk about. Uh, and you'll see us talking a lot more about these kind of threads and other kinds of threads as we discuss all of the individual methods throughout the remaining of the semester, the remainder of the semester. You'll see how each method, remember the take home message from day one was all methods are flawed. Well, this will so keep recurring. All methods are flawed. We're just going to sort of go into more depth and, and detail and, and the specific ways in which they're flawed. Uh, so I, I'm not going to talk more about that now. But really, um, I guess there's something else I want to draw your attention to here. Um, so we talked about research questions last week, right? Remember that? Um, like, what was the research question here? Was it that tool A, in this case, say the NL2 code? AI was better than tool B, which was no tool in, in this case, or writing code from scratch. Was this the research question? And you know, was this a good research question? We've sort of had a lengthy discussion of how to formulate research questions last time. So what would count as an answer here? And what use would that answer be? And what, what does uh, this answering this question contribute to, to knowledge? Right, so what do you do? You have any thoughts on the research question itself, as as formulated, based on our discussion last week? I mean, as at a high level, they're they are seemingly reasonable, but they don't give any. Um, there's no information on how they're going to be evaluated, so it's not really clear what's going on. I'd, I'd be fine with this as a question, but it needs more to be able to be answered. I guess what I expect is some more criticism along the lines of last lecture that the question as, as formulated is tool A better than tool B. It's just too underspecified. It's too, too vague to really be um, answerable, I guess is what I'm, what I'm getting at. So it's unclear what would count as an answer to this, is tool A better than tool B, right? So like, is it a little better, a lot better? Like, you know, even so very basic things like that. So um, think about how people are actually um, doing this um, in, in medical trials when they are uh, comparing say drugs, if, if a treatment is better than, if one treatment is better than another, like how is it that people are doing this, right? So, that's really probably not a good research question um, um, or, or by itself is insufficient. So why do we need to know this? Why do we need that? What is it really that we're trying to do when we're asking this comparative question, um, comparing uh, one drug to another? For example, is some piece of missing information here. Why would we expect it to be better? Like, um, you know, is there some sort of fundamental reason why we expect it to be better? Or maybe it's just not meant to be better. So that, you know, maybe in right, depending on this, depending on whether we expect it to be better or not and why, um, that changes what we find to be an acceptable answer to this question. What will we do with the answer once we, uh, we have it? Like, who cares about this? What do we do with this? Is this part of something else? Does it have implications for something else? Better when and how, like in what conditions is it meant to be better? How is it, how is it meant to be better? When is it meant to be better? Uh, better in what way? Like, what does it mean to be better? Does it mean that people have fewer side effects? Does it mean that they get better sooner? Does it, what does it mean? Does it mean that they don't turn green as much? Like, what, what does better mean here? Um, but in better doing what, right? So like all of these questions, this is sort of a rehash of, of kind of how we criticized research questions uh, last uh, week. So now, um, really key here is, is this question. Why would you expect it to be better? Um, and what I'm trying to make, the point I'm trying to make in this part of the lecture is that you got to have some theory. This is the take home message. You got to have a theory. You got to have a theory that sort of informs why you expect one drug to be better than another. You got to have a theory that informs why you expect one tool to be better than another. So what do I mean by this? Like, what's a theory? A theory is uh, a set of propositions that are logically related that express relationships between different constructs and, and uh, possibly other propositions. So it's just 
a theory is just a set of constructs with the relationships between them. Uh, and these are sort of logically related. Uh, I think um, you'll find this a general enough definition. So what, does, what, what are the characteristics of a theory? Well, first of all, a theory identifies and defines hopefully precisely the constructs, the phenomena, the whatever of interest here. So, um, you know, in, in the case of the medical trial, it would define the, the illness, the characteristics of the drugs and so on, the constructs there um, that are of interest. The theory um, is, makes assertions about the nature of these constructs. Um, the theory makes assertions about the causal relationships between these constructs. That's a very important part of a theory that is able to uh, make assertions about causal relationships between constructs. If a theory is really good, um, it should also to explain the underlying mechanism behind these causal relationships. Uh, we talked a little bit, I think, in the first lecture about how um, identifying that there exists a causal relationship between two things doesn't necessarily explain the underlying mechanism for that causal relationship. Um, knowing that, um, I don't know, uh, oranges cures curvy is a causal relationship, but you don't really understand the underlying mechanism, which is a vitamin C deficiency that explains sort of why that happens and how that happens. Okay, so there are two independent things. And a good theory sort of also has this uh, characteristic of explaining why uh, certain things happen, explaining the underlying mechanisms. Um, and the theories in general are the building blocks of science everywhere. So I, you know, I, I keep mentioning this, that this class is not really so much about software engineering as computer science as it is about science in general. Uh, this is another instance of that. Um, theories are, are sort of universal to uh, all branches of science. Um, and um, that's great because they uh, explain how and why phenomena occur uh, and they allow predictions. That's very, very useful. Um, so uh, that's sort of, you know, the theory of gravity and so on allows predictions. If I drop this remote, I, so I can predict what will happen to it. I can predict the speed with which it will fall and so on. I, I could, all kinds of things I can predict about the behavior of this particular phenomenon, knowing the underlying theory behind this. Um, and I guess, you know, theories you can um, think of as having different levels of, of, of confidence or support. So, and typically the more empirical data there is supporting any particular theory, the stronger the theory becomes. So I don't know, conspiracy theories maybe have some uh, empirical data, but maybe probably little. Uh, you know, other theories like the theory of gravity uh, have maybe a lot more empirical data supporting them um, and so on. So there's different levels of confidence you can have in these. Okay. Um, Theories can be descriptive, they, they can be uh, predictive, uh, different range of, of theories and different purposes, that, that's all fine. You can read more about this uh, offline. Um, they can also have different levels of explanatory power. So you can have sort of gen general grand universal theories that explain uh, grand societal uh, phenomena like uh, I don't know, like Mar Marxist theory of society. So that's sort of a grand scale uh, theory. Uh, you could also have sort of something in between, or you could have micro theories in the social sciences. You, you see people sort of talking about micro theories. Um, there's a branch of uh, sociology called micro sociology. So micro theories have to do with sort of individual level phenomena and interpersonal interactions and things like this. So very, very, very small scale things and, and anything in between really. Um, so you don't so need to have a, a grand universal theory for, for you to have a, any theory. You can have a theory that refers to smaller things. Um, you can also have sort of competing theories for the same phenomenon. Um, sometimes you can have different theories that address different aspects of a phenomenon. Uh, that's all fine. Uh, other times you can even have sort of competing theories that address the same aspect of a phenomenon that sort of compete for explaining a particular phenomenon. Uh, that's also fine and happens often. Um, typically, the so simpler, uh, more elegant theories are the ones that are preferred. Uh, there's this, uh, in, in statistics, for example, there's this uh, principle of, of parsimony that um, 
that says that uh, the simpler explanations are preferable to more complicated ones. And so this applies here as well. Uh, I guess the point of all of this is, um, even when you sort of think that you've identified some theory that's maybe uh, of, of relevance to you, um, it's probably worth reading broadly to see uh, what, if anything else, uh, competes with that or, or offers uh, additional explanations, addresses different aspects of the phenomenon you're studying. Okay, any, any thoughts or questions on this? Um, you're talking about the necessity of theories and you're, you're, the one example that you gave, I think was kind of interesting here with, uh, with scurvy. And uh, so we knew, we, Royal, we knew that um, citrus fruit would improve, would result in people not getting scurvy before we knew the mechanism at all. Mm -hmm. But sort of seems like the theory here didn't really matter for us to get practical use of this knowledge. And I'm, I'm just wondering, like, isn't there some value in knowledge, even if you don't understand about a relationship, even if you don't understand the purpose of the connection or the, the mechanism behind the connection? Absolutely. I just said that a theory is better if it also has um, the ability to explain the underlying mechanism. But it's certainly still, it can be perfectly good even, even without uh, having that. I just said that it's better when it has that ability. Okay. And your example was a great one of, of, of you know, why a theory could still be useful, even if we don't understand the underlying mechanism. I think this, um, in the machine learning context, there probably has a lot of discussion around that, like, can we rely on machine learning models if we don't understand how it achieves some kind of perfect results? And it's probably applied to this uh, questions as well. If we don't understand the theory behind it, like how can I be sure it will always work like every single time? What if there was some like weird thing that happened on this specific case that causes this problem, but not the, the general one? No, this is a, not a general rule. Um, yeah, and I think that uh, talks about the, um, or, or touches on the point I was making earlier about how the more empirical data you have supporting a theory, the stronger the theory becomes. Um, so I guess, you, you know, you can still have a weakly predictive theory or in your example, maybe the, uh, the ML out model is a, is a theory perhaps. Um, you could still have one, it's just a weakly predictive and so less, um, less trustworthy maybe, less, you can be less confident in it. I, I've, that's an interesting thought. I've never thought of, um, kind of mapping out the analogy between a machine learning model and a theory in this sense, in a sort of scientific sense. Um, I, I need to think more about that. Thanks for the comment. Okay, so th th this is, uh, let me move on to something slightly uh, different kind of building on this. Um, a few definitions, it's useful to understand these terms. You will see them uh, recur often in, in research papers uh, and it's sort of useful to understand what they mean uh, because they're so not entirely obvious. They certainly weren't obvious to me um, even before I was preparing this lecture. So I think, I think this might be useful. So, um, there's this question of, we have the concept of a theory and we talked about that before, but there's also a concept of a theoretical framework and, and separately a concept of a conceptual framework you will see referenced or mentioned in research papers. Like how do these things relate? Is a theoretical framework the same as a theory? Is a conceptual framework different still from either one of the previous two? Or what's the relationship between these terms? What do people mean when they, uh, when they mention these terms? What, what do these things mean? So. The, let me start with the theoretical framework. So here, essentially, the theoretical framework is um, a reflection of all the work that you as the researcher are doing to use theory in any given study. It's sort of the, the way that the process, uh, the work you do to take theory 
which is sort of an abstract thing and apply it specifically to your study in some form. You know, try to translate it and apply it and operationalize it specifically in your context. Okay, this is sort of roughly what is meant by a theoretical framework. Whenever you see this term, that's kind of what people should mean. I don't know if that they, uh, they always mean that, but that's what they should mean when they say that. Um, so it's basically, um, so this, uh, think of it as, as theory plus plus. It's this um, um, set of concepts and premises, just like a theory that are logically developed and connected. Um, and you, um, you go through this work of uh, defining these concepts and, and sort of figuring out what your theories are that will ground your research, uniting them perhaps across theories. We talked about how you might have competing theories that describe different aspects of a phenomenon or even uh, the same phenomenon. Um, uh, so the work that you do to kind of make sense of all of these different theories and make them concrete and oper operation operationalizable and applicable to your particular study, this is sort of the theoretical framework of, of your study. Okay, so the work you do to apply theory in your study is the theoretical framework. The conceptual framework is um, essentially the justification uh, for why a, a, your particular study should be conducted. That's what so people mean by conceptual framework. So that's sort of slightly different from the theoretical framework. Conceptual framework is essentially all of the extra stuff that happens in a, in a research study to, to justify the study's existence, right? So perhaps, uh, you know, literature review is part of this. We're gonna talk more about that later. Uh, identifying the knowledge gaps uh, after doing this literature review. What are the things we don't yet know? Therefore, we need to do uh, this particular study. Um, describing the so mechanics and the methodology and so on of any particular study. So this is kind of what people refer to as the conceptual framework of the study. It's just uh, everything else that has to do with um, uh, to why a particular uh, research study needs to happen. Um, and so how it contributes to the literature. These are the kinds of things that uh, uh, make up a conceptual framework. So there's nothing in here uh, about the theory per se. You can have a conceptual framework and, and all studies do have a conceptual framework and uh, not all, all studies have a theoretical framework or theory, but all of them have a conceptual framework. Okay, so now we talked about um, different styles of doing research, different philosophical worldview, different worldviews, different strat strategies of inquiry in previous lectures. Like how do all of these things that we talked about today relate to things that we talked about last week? So here are some ways. Um, if you're a positivist, um, then you typically think of theories as things that have strong predictive power um, yeah, so you think of theories as cause and effect models um, and uh, things that allow you to predict the effect of something given a cause of, for that something. If you're a constructivist, remember this distinction between the two major philosophical worldviews, um, you don't think of theories in this way, but rather you think of theories as um, strengthening your understanding of some complex situation or phenomenon um, and you'll see theories here that um, these theories in constructivist research, they most often use things like analogies and categorizations and so taxonomies, things like that. This is sort of the kind of theory that you'll see more often with constructivist style research than with positivist style research. Okay, so let's, let's dive deeper a little bit into this. So how do people actually use theory uh, in research studies, given these different uh, strategies of inquiry or, or worldviews. So the, um, the positivists, the people that are doing deductive research, they typically start from some uh, existing theory, this theory as the starting point of a study. Uh, and th what the theory offers is some testable components, right? You, because you have these descriptions and these cause and effect relationships. And these can be examined. They can be examined, they can be operationalized. You can measure variables and so on. You can control them in a study, all kinds of things like this. Um, and so you take the theory and you generate some specific hypotheses and those specific hypotheses form the foundation for, for a study. Okay, that makes sense? 
so I guess, in other words, the theory is part of the, the object of research um, and it should be testable on the one hand, right? So you can't really design a study in this um, strategy of inquiry, this kind of study, uh, unless your theory is testable. If you can't derive any hypotheses and test them, then it's sort of, it's not a good theory. It's not, a, you, can't, you can't really do anything about this. Um, and also like the theory should be open to being falsified. Uh, that's kind of an underlying assumption here. And what does knowledge mean in this, in this context? But knowledge in this context means evidence from you testing these hypotheses that either supports or refines or challenges or extends that theory that you started from. So you see this linear progression. You start with some theory, you develop some hypotheses, collect data, uh, measure variables, uh, do some analysis, uh, com complicated or not, uh, have some findings, you interpret those findings, and then this interpretation is what leads back into the theory. You either find support or you need to refine the theory based on what you're observing empirically, you need to challenge the theory and so on. Okay. So the, we, we talked about this before, the theoretical framework and, and this um, objectivist deductive style of research is, um, all the work you do to put this theory or set of theories to, to the test. It's um, defining, articulating the context, defining the constructs, uh, defining the specific assumptions and hypotheses and so on. Um, all of these things that you do to make the theory testable in your specific context is the theoretical framework. And the conceptual framework is, um, it's sort of everything else that's part of the study. So description of the literature and, and a description of the methodology and, and things like that. That's uh, what makes up the conceptual framework. Uh, the, the thing to note here is that these things typically are finalized before the study and they're rarely changed once data collection has started. So it's something that you go into a study with. It's something that happens at the beginning of the study is the input rather than the output uh, of the study. So this was so the positivist worldview with objectivist deductive style research. The constructivist worldview with typically subjectivist inductive research is as you'd expect quite different. So here um, theory is not the input, but it's the product of that research. Does that make sense? So you'll see that uh, maybe the most well-known uh, research method uh, in this strategy of inquiry is, is grounded theory. We're going to talk about that in more detail later. Um, that literally means generating theory from the data, grounded in the data. It's the most fully inductive research method there is there. You start from these empirical observations and you uh, build your theory up from, from these. to so bottom up, completely bottom up, completely inductive. Um, and um, here you can have you can have one or more theories informing the research pr process, uh, and they can um, they tend to shape every stage of that research process, um, including sort of the, how you formulate research questions and what data you collect and things like this, but also uh, through how you interpret your your results. Um, and theory development here or refinement in some cases. Uh, is, is typically a major research output. So you, the output of this style of research is, is theory, um, unlike with the other stance where theory is more, more the input than the output. Um, okay, so, so step back for a second. This was sort of, um, this was important. So there's actually three, um, three different ways in which you can use theory with so subjectivist style uh, research. Um, we talked about two, two before, like first one was pure grounded theory, where you don't go in with any assumptions or any theory, and you build everything from, from the ground up from scratch, okay? This was the first way in which researchers um, use theory um, when, they, when they take the stance. The second was when you sort of have some, some theory guiding your process, 
but you still kind of contribute back refinements and so on. You're still, theory is still part of the output, but it also guides a little bit the research questions you're asking and the kinds of data you collect and so on. You go in with some underlying theory and that informs your entire process. That was number two. Um, and finally, number three, that's also possible. Um, you can think of theory or you can use theory as an interpretive lens, as an interpretive tool. So here, um, you don't go in to, to your study with really um, a predefined uh, theory or set of theories, but rather your findings as you're discovering them and, and interpreting them to dictate which theory or which lens you sort of uh, end up uh, committing to and, and applying. Um, and you um, may even need to go back and sort of modify things uh, part way uh, as, uh, as sort of some, you discover some new theory that becomes relevant along the way. So, so theory used for interpretation, kind of in the last stage of a study, right? So these are um, three uh, different ways in which people use theory when they're doing subjectivist inductive research. Uh, and they're all perfectly valid. There's no, uh, you know, one is better than, uh, than another. They're also different styles of research. Um, but the point is, um, either way, um, you sort of have to make some uh, explicit decisions when you're doing studies about when and how you're planning on, on using theory, because that impacts everything else as we've discussed. So you sort of have to think about this deliberately. It's, it, one is not better than the other, but you sort of just have to think about sort of what, you're, what you're doing and which one makes sense in your context. Um, okay, so th this is more of the same. So, um, you know, how subjectivist inductive researchers use a conceptual framework. This again is putting the theory to, to the test. Um, and um, similarly for conceptual uh, frameworks, kind of the, the other stuff that's part of the study. So I won't go into, into much more of that. Here, you can find more details about, about all of this and, and more nuance in the readings. Um, I won't go into more of that now. Let me show you one example. Oh, first of all, so how are we doing with questions or thoughts on, on all of these above? So um, I had a question. Um, so from the papers that we read like last week, um, I guess specifically on the how to break an API, mm -hmm. the constant negotiation, um, would you say that leans more towards the um, inductive uh, reasoning in like the second, uh, the second statement in which, uh, or the second point which you made in that theory kind of guided how the whole study was taken. What do people think? I'm gonna open this up, someone from the class. Question was reflecting back. So let me try to um, expand a bit on the question. That was a very good question, Kat. Reflecting back on the two studies we discussed in some detail last week, the, the Bogart paper on um, you know, understanding why people break APIs uh, and the Ray Marcus paper testing some specific, or uh, I guess, um, studying some specific practice for managing uh, breaking change, reducing breaking changes, which, which was this semantic versioning practice and still studying how, how frequent and widely used that particular practice is. So these were the two papers we discussed last week. Question now is, so how was theory being used in, in either one of those? Like which stance were the two studies uh, taking and how were they using theory, if at all? Let's see. Is that is that what you meant, Kyle? Or am I capturing the, the question? Yeah, that's right. So what do people think? Let's let's simplify. So the Bogart at, at all paper was that inductive or deductive? Constructivist or positivist? Uh, 
So I think the the Bogart one, so the, the API one is inductive, I think, like because they try to generate theories from the interview. Mm -hmm. And the other one is more like deductive. So they have some theory defined as research questions and they want to verify the, the theories. Right? Mm -hmm. do, do people agree with this? Was that CJ? Was that you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, well, I was not on the camera. So yeah, even if you were, I think my screen only shows uh, the first few people. So I, I don't see everyone. Thank you. Do folks agree with that? Does anybody who disagrees with with CJ on this? And and why? I think that's right. Personally, I, that's my interpretation of these two papers as well. I, I thought the Bogart paper uh, so took this subjectivist worldview and tried to build theory, tried to build a theory of when and why people break APIs. Uh, and um, the, the output was more or less explicitly this, this grounded theory. Um, the Raymarkers paper went in with some underlying theory, although I think they didn't make that explicit. The theory was implicit. Uh, the theory was maybe, uh, I don't know, that semantic versioning is a practice that can help with um, um, reducing breaking changes and you know something sort of building on this but they've never really made the theory per se explicit but they um, they had some underlying theory about kind of the practices and so on the, the context there uh, and they went and I guess tested uh, hypotheses about the or answer research questions about the presence of that specific phenomenon so I think Kyle to your question right so I, I think the Bogart paper was this inductive, was an example of this inductive style, a subjectivist worldview, building theory from the ground up. And the Raymarkers paper, the opposite, or the deductive style, maybe positivist worldview, kind of testing um, this, the presence of this particular practice as, a, as one hypothesis or a research question. So let me, let me give you one example. Uh, we talked about the um, the Bogart paper as an example of kind of building theory from the ground up. Let me give you an example of um, to using the theory uh, as part of a research study uh, from the opposite uh, worldview, taking this positivist stance um, and uh, it's a deductive strategy of inquiry. And um, so how, how you might use something like this in a research study. So I'm going to talk about this theory that is borrowed from a different domain. It needn't even be a computer science theory. I want to sort of show you how um, a lot of what's happening when you think about computer scientists or software engineers or what have you, practitioners that use computing, uh, a lot of the, what's happening uh, with people there uh, is actually more general than, than you might think. So this is an example of signaling theory. Signaling theory is this idea that came out of uh, evolutionary biology um, where um, you can, so signals are these visible cues or clues that imply some hidden quality. And the quality is hidden, it's not easily observable, but you have these visible things, these clues, signals, that tell you something about the presence or absence of that underlying quality. And you're using these to make inferences and decisions. You're using these signals, these visible things, because you don't have an opportunity to measure more accurately, probably, or observe more accurately, the hidden underlying quality. Does that make sense? So you're using some cheap signal um, that's more readily available over something that's harder to observe. So, the theory talks about roughly two kinds of these signals. There's two types, uh, assessment signals on the one hand, conventional signals on the other hand. Assessment signals are those where the signal cannot be produced unless you actually have that quality. So they're hard to fake. You can't really produce them without having a quality. For example, 
uh, I don't know, me driving around in a Ferrari uh, is hard to achieve without me being rich. I would uh, first need to have a lot of money to be able to afford a Ferrari before I could uh, be seen driving around in one, right? So the observing me, the, the Ferrari is a signal, observing me driving around in a Ferrari um, suggests that I have this sort of hidden underlying quality, which is lots of money, for example. Right, it would be hard to fake. I, I mean, I could maybe borrow a Ferrari for a day or so, uh, I imagine, but sort of observing me consistently uh, driving around, coming to campus in a Ferrari would, uh, would be hard to fake unless I actually had a Ferrari, right? Um, so th these are assessment signals. Conventional signals are, uh, as the name suggests, uh, agreed upon by convention. Their meaning is agreed upon by convention. So they only continue to exist if they're enforced by, by norms, by social norms or whatever. Um, they, um, they needn't imply the presence of this underlying quality. So I mentioned this all comes from evolutionary biology. Uh, here's a classic example, uh, starting as an honest signal that um, these, uh, I don't know, a type of deer are uh, actually quite uh, healthy. Like, what does this do? Why is this a signal? So starting is this sort of jumping uh, up and down with like all of your legs just to. I mean, jump really high. If you're if you're not healthy, you can't be jumping up and down. It's just mm. a property of being healthy. So you can move. Right, so presumably if you're old or ill or whatever, you can't really do this. So if I see, uh, if I see a deer doing this, jumping really, really high, uh, I can infer that it's probably quite healthy uh, and in good shape. And if I'm a predator that eats deer for a living, then it's this particular deer like jumping really, really high. It's probably not the one I want to be chasing because it's going to be quite a workout. I'm much better off chasing one that appears to be limping or something because there's a chance I will actually catch that one. The chance that will catch it is higher than, than this one. Okay. So this is an honest signal. You can't really do this on, unless you're you know, agile and, and fast and, and healthy. Uh, and that makes you harder to, to catch by predators. Here's another example, super classic example, the peacock tail feathers. This is called a handicap signal. Does anybody know why I'm calling this a handicap signal? What, what do the feathers do? Except look shiny and rainbow hued. Mm. They're used to, I guess, attract females. Right. So they um, they help with mating. They help with attracting partners um, because the, the the bird that is seen displaying uh, sort of you know a, a rich uh, set of tail feathers like this is perceived as being more uh, more attractive. Now, why is that? And why am I calling this a handicap signal? Why is it a handicap signal? But what does the name suggest? So the idea here is that while uh, potentially advantageous for finding a, a mating partner, um, these tail feathers are technically also a handicap to the birds because while having this tail up, the bird becomes much more easily observable by predators, so much more at risk of being eaten by whatever eats peacocks, um, and also much slower and harder to run and move around because of you know this giant thing that takes up a lot of energy to just keep up and sort of walk around in. So in that sense, you can think of the, the tail feathers as a handicap to the bird because um, it, it sort of inhibits its mobility. Make sense? And 
this is also uh, presumably a an honest signal, by the way, just like we were talking about uh, starting before, because if um, I'm looking to mate with a, a, a peacock and I observe one like this that has a very uh, shiny uh, tail, then the fact that I'm observing it and it's still alive and it hasn't been eaten is sort of indication that it's sort of a, a strong, healthy animal that would make for a, a good mating partner. Um, if it wasn't, because it's higher risk of being eaten this way, if it wasn't, then it would have already been eaten. So I wouldn't be observing it. The fact that I see one means that I sort of I can trust that this is a potentially a good uh, mating partner. Um, do you? Uh, can I can I ask yeah. a question? Um, so I guess I was a little bit confused about why it was a handicap signal because I've also read that um, these feathers can be used as an intimidation technique against predators. So it's not like it, there's a complete downside in the, I guess. So, so I, I would agree with everything you said about how it makes it like physically weaker, but um, I guess that it's not completely a, a, like just a handicap in the sense because it all includes benefits. Absolutely. And I mean, the, the mating was a, another benefit too. You know, um, these birds are more likely to find mating partners when they have uh, these shiny tails. So certainly there are advantages. Just It's the term the literature uses to refer to these. They're called handicap signals in the literature. And in this particular case, uh, I, I believe the designation comes from the fact that it impairs mobility and agility. So in that sense, it's, a, it's seen as a handicap, as a uh, but but it doesn't imply that it doesn't have any advantages. The, the mating advantage was the one I offered myself as an example, and and yours is is good too. Makes sense. Thanks. So here's here's another one. Um, this um, particular snake uh, happens to be very poisonous. So if you're uh, some type of uh, animal or whatever um, organism that eats snakes, you probably want to avoid the ones that look like this because they're poisonous. So guess what happens? You have, um, you see these in, in sort of nature uh, occurring naturally. The, you also have these non-poisonous snakes that are cheating. They're not poisonous but they're sort of mimicking this um, coloring scheme of the poisonous ones to confuse predators, right? Into thinking that they are also poisonous, which puts them as an, at an evolutionary advantage because they're less likely to be eaten this way. Uh, whoever eats these kind of snakes will think that uh, these are maybe also poisonous and will uh, avoid them rather than trying to eat them. So you also, you also see sort of um, how they can be used um, to, to deceive in this way signals. Um, as, a, as an example of a conventional signal, what, take, for example, my web page or your web page or any web page. Whatever I write in here is something that I have control over. I can write uh, anything. I could claim that I'm a Turing Award winner and, and whatever else you could think of. Uh, and um, there's really no, um, um, I, I needn't be those things. I needn't have those underlying qualities in order to create this signal. Um, and the only reason why sort of people don't, don't do this is though the social norms and conventions that um, make this kind of behavior frowned upon. But it doesn't mean that this kind of behavior doesn't happen. So for example, um, you can see uh, people that are, are very proud of um, having bought fake job references on the internet um, to uh, help them land a job. And you know, sometimes it works. Uh, certainly, there's uh, there's cases, right? That's why people do it because it, it works. Um, there's you know even companies that are offering this kind of service. So if you're you know thinking of making an extra buck on the side uh, besides your grad student stipend and whatnot, you know, here's a dishonest way of of, of doing that if you're uh, looking for an idea, a business idea. But really, by and large, um, it's sort of the norms, the social norms, and so on that uh, enforce the trustworthiness of these kind of conventional signals. Okay, so um, you needn't have the underlying qualities in order to display these conventional signals, whereas with the assessment style ones you sort of do. 
Okay, so how do we how do we use something like this? This was evolutionary biology, quite quite a, a ways away from software engineering, computer science, uh, whatever. So, but here's a very good, straightforward application of, of this theory or, or relevance of this theory on uh, a uh, software engineering problem. So um, I uh, am studying how people collaborate to develop open source software. Uh, as one of the things that I that I do as part of my research, uh, and um, as part of this, I study collaborative online platforms like GitHub, that happens to be the most popular that people use in order to collaborate to to create and maintain open source software. Um, and turns out that these online platforms have a whole bunch of uh, signals that they display on the platform as part of uh, one's profile page or a. a, a repositories, profile page. Some of them are built in. You could have, you know, uh, you can think of all of these uh, metrics that you see there on a GitHub page as signals of something, right? For example, uh, there's a metric that tells you that this particular repository has 16,000 and some stars from, from other people. So it's very, very popular. That tells you something about sort of the, some underlying quality of this of this software project. The fact that it's so popular uh, for so many people tells you something about um, about the project. Um, but also, like in addition to all of these uh, built-in signals, you can have all kinds of custom ones in the form of these little repository badges that you see there on the bottom. Uh, that the maintainers of these projects are are free to choose and to adopt and to implement uh, as they please. So there's tons of these. Uh, I don't know. We, when we started looking at this, there were about, about 100 or so different ones that we uh, observed in the wild being used. Um, and they serve tons of purposes. Uh, I won't go over all of this now. I'm happy to talk about this uh, separately. But just to give you as for one example, um, even here, right? if you think of these badges as signals of some something, um, we can also distinguish between um, the theorized assessment and conventional signals. Like, why do I say this? So, for example, you can have uh, badges that indicate some um, uh, something about so some quality software quality assurance mechanism being used in that project that has to do with code quality, with testing, with things like this that have to do with with software quality. Uh, the status of the uh, build, uh, I don't know, whatever kinds of static analysis tools you might run and so on. So for example, you could have uh, a badge that tells you whether all the tests have passed or some have failed. Or you could have a badge that tells you um, how many test cases do you have checking the quality of your software there. Do you have lots? How That's a test coverage badge. Uh, in this case, we're indicating 90% coverage. Uh, from the existing test cases and so on. But you can see that all of these have some kind of underlying analysis that um, needs to run, needs to happen. There's some underlying computation that needs to happen. You need to, I don't know, measure how many tests you have and how much code do they cover. You need to run them to see if they pass or fail, things like this. There's some underlying analysis that needs to happen before you can display these, um, these values on these badges. And these are so continuously being updated. As um, another example, you could have um, just more of a purely informational style badges that um, people can display without running any kind of underlying analysis. So here, um, to give an example, there's a badge uh, that indicates the particular license that the open source project has adopted. In this case, the BSD license. That's just purely informational. There's no so underlying analysis or anything that, that needs to happen in order for that value to be computed. It's so just, uh, if anything, it's a spurious piece of information because the license is already recorded somewhere else in this uh, open source repository. So you don't really need this. But, um, so I guess you can sort of think about these badges from this lens of signaling theory, uh, and you can distinguish between badges with values that are expensive to uh, compute and therefore to fake. Uh, all of these that have to do with, I don't know, testing and code quality and static analysis and dependency management and what have you. 
um, on the one hand, and badges that either are very cheap to uh, to display or, or or require no cost at all, like the one I mentioned about uh, uh, the particular license or uh, the fact that they welcome pull request contributions that sort of doesn't take any cost at all to, to display this is not something that's sort of continuously being updated. It's not something that changes presumably uh, very often or, or at all and so on. So expensive versus cheap, complicated underlying analysis versus trivial or no analysis to, to display. So this is exactly the kind of um, distinction that the theory makes between assessment signals those with sort of some complicated underlying analysis in this case, and conventional signals, those without any. Does that make sense? So here we've sort of taken this, um, this is the uh, theoretical framework. We talked about theory versus theoretical framework. The theoretical framework in this case is taking the signaling theory from evolutionary biology and making it concrete, applying it specifically to this particular domain and this context and sort of defining these uh, concepts here and sort of looking, looking at badges, reasoning about them in terms of this underlying uh, signaling theory. Um, and, oh yeah, right. So, you know, can you, can you trust, can you always trust, uh, side note, can you always trust um, these assessment signals um, that uh, require some complicated uh, analysis to, uh, to compute? Uh, just like can you always trust the, um, I don't know, the, that the, the best peacock to mate with is the one with the biggest tail or that you shouldn't go chasing the uh, deer that jumps very high and, and so on. Um, in general, yes, but not always, obviously. There's always exceptions to anything. There's exceptions here too. I mentioned this because it was a funny example. You see how in this particular case, um, the maintainers of this specific project have actually taken a screenshot of this badge um, that indicates them having sort of high maximal test coverage and sort of badge looking green and so on, kind of painting them in a positive light. Whereas actually there is no underlying analysis being run here. That's sort of just a, just a screenshot that's pasted in, in place of the actual badge that uh, is being updated. So here they're, they're cheating um, with this. But in general, in general, these things with underlying analyses, the assessment signals are uh, considered to be more trustworthy. Okay, so this, this was a framework. So now here's what we could do with this. We could take this framework um, and we can derive specific, or test this, take this theory and derive specific hypotheses from this theory that apply to our constructs in our domain. So for example, we could, um, we could hypothesize here, the, I guess the fundamental um, uh, assertion part of the theory would be, uh, the raw theory, the pure theory would be that assessment signals are trustworthy, conventional signals less so, okay? Talked about that uh, at, at length. So here, like what would that look like? What would that translate to in this case? So for example, in our case, a hypothesis could be that um, if I adopt one of these uh, quality assurance badges that are uh, expensive and so on and require some um, underlying computation, um, then something better should happen than, than if I adopt some sort of trivial badge that doesn't do anything. Um, and for example, right, if I adopt um, uh, build, uh, status badge and or a test coverage badge, I should expect to see more pull requests uh, that include test cases because I'm signaling to the outside world and to my contributors that I care about testing and I care about code quality as a maintainer of this project. And um, I should expect to, to see some return uh, with this. Um, and so somebody seeing these, uh, these badges that are generally hard to fake and so on, so they're therefore more trustworthy, would believe that I actually care about code quality and, and testing and, and things like this. So they're likely to respond in kind to this, right? And we're actually seeing this. We're seeing this very, very nicely in, in the data. And we're actually gonna uh, spend a lecture later in the semester um, going over the specific statistics we use to arrive at these conclusions 
but just to show you kind of visually to give you a flavor uh, and I'm kind of extracting myself from the, the scene here. You can see how um, I'm showing on the Y axis, the fraction of pull requests containing test cases monthly. Um, and on the X axis, I'm showing you nine months shown before and after the adoption of these different badges across a large sample of open source projects. And the conclusion is that there is an increase in the monthly fraction of pull requests containing test cases after they start adopting these badges. And so you can see sort of people naturally reacting to, um, to these signals and so changing their behavior. In this case, the people submitting pull requests to contributors to these open source projects, changing their behavior in response to these signals. So that, that's sort of the idea behind signaling that you uh, sort of rely on these visible clues, these signals, and you sort of make some decision, take some action based on these, as opposed to kind of going and to, um, observing and measuring these underlying qualities yourself that are not as readily uh, visible. So I, I, I hope that was clear in this context that none of these um, underlying qualities were um, as readily available without these badges, right? If I want to know if the build is passing or failing, I actually have to run it, right? That sort of requires some technical uh, uh, efforts. The same for the test coverage value. If I want to compute that, I have to run the entire test suite and sort of compute this. So it's not highly non-trivial to do that. Whereas the signals just make that very readily observable. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll skip this in the interest of time. You can find more details here and kind of uh, another hypothesis that could be derived and tested uh, from the theory uh, in this domain. So I guess to, to wrap this part up, the, um, I've shown you an example of how, so starting from this positivist deductive stance, positivist worldview, the deductive strategy of inquiry, how um, this one theory borrowed from a very distant domain, the theory of signaling, uh, can be um, applied and used as a lens to think about some, some very specific software engineering practice or, or phenomenon. Um, and um, I, I've shown you that a lot of the things that, um, a lot of the predictions that the theory is able to make and say the, the natural world uh, in, in the pure sense, also have analogs in this sort of software engineering domain. Uh, and, um, and specifically when it comes to these, these badges as signals, I've sort of shown you something very narrow, very specific, but that adds, that adds knowledge that builds to this um, theory that has never been sort of applied or tested in this particular domain, right? We sort of knew that, um, I don't know, the animals maybe uh, fit this theory well. Uh, we didn't know that source open source software developers fit this theory well. And this was one instance, one way in which we have observed them fitting this theory. And certainly you can think of others as well uh, in addition to this. So just one, one teeny tiny example of how um, th this uh, theory um, was very informative and useful and allowed us even to make predictions and, and derive hypotheses and, and inform how we went about testing them and so on in this narrow domain. The second, I guess, so you can ask, you know, so what? Like, um, what do we do with this? Like, um, what's the point? Well, so um, in the pure, in its purest form, right, the, um, in, in, in biology, the theory talks about how the signals that are harder to fake, those of the assessment kind, they tend to be more reliable, right? So, you know, you can't really trust my, uh, the information you see on my webpage because I can very easily fake that. I have full control over my webpage versus you can probably trust that I'm rich more, for example, if you see me driving around in a Ferrari all day. But if I just claim on my website that I'm really rich, that, you know, there's no real evidence to substantiate that. But if you see me driving around in a Ferrari all day, that's probably much more trustworthy, uh, right? Provides more, um, more evidence. So what does that mean in our case, right? So if you think of these badges as signals, um, 
that means, uh, and so first of all, we confirm this. We've also observed, and I haven't shown the evidence here, but we could talk about this separately. We've observed that um, if you think of these badges in the same way as assessment signals versus conventional signals, um, by and large, um, the one, the assessment signal badges are much more reliable. And uh, we could talk about what that means separately. So we, we, we can confirm this, but we could then also take this um, theory and sort of um, implication of this theory and so do something with it in our domain. So as one tiny example, again, um, but something very concrete, if you have the choice of um, designing new badges for whatever purpose, right? The implication is that you should design them more as assessment signals if you can, rather than uh, the conventional signals because they will likely uh, give you more benefits. If they're harder to fake, they're, they're therefore more uh, trustworthy, more reliable, and, and therefore uh, more beneficial. So you should choose to do this whenever you, you have the chance. So uh, for example, you, instead of um, linking to um, a Slack channel as, as one of these badges, um, and kind of, uh, you know, people can join the Slack channel or something by clicking on that badge. Instead of doing this, this is just a you know, static, uh, cheap signal, doesn't require any uh, I don't know, underlying analysis and whatnot. So of doing this, you could instead uh, design this badge as an assessment signal that, for example, uh, indicates at any point in time, the number of people that are active and are present to respond to your questions over Slack or something or indicates the, I don't know, average response time over the last 24 hours to people's questions or uh, things like this, indicates your place in line for asking a question, whatever. So something that requires some underlying computation and is harder to fake. Uh, and, you know, in fact, this is a real example. These kind of badges exist. So just that some open source maintainers choose one flavor over the other. And we can, so using this theory, uh, predict uh, sort of confidently um, that they should actually prefer one over the other and to all the reasons why that is the case. So let me let me stop here for uh, for, for a minute and maybe uh, take some questions from people. Do we have a total of one minute left? Does this go until 3.40 or 3.50? It's 3.40. 3.40, okay. So let me let me stop here. Um, there, if you'll allow me one minute just to wrap this up, um, that'd be great. Can we, can we do that? Sure. Okay. Um, so I guess the one thing I wanna leave you with is that um, maybe the example I gave you with uh, you know, you could say, "Math, this doesn't really apply to me." Like, I'm, you know, this maybe applies to you, Bogdan, because you sort of do more of this empirical research uh, in, in your work, but doesn't really apply as much to me because I'm mostly building tools and, and things like this systems. Um, that is uh, false. So I want to leave you with with that thought that um, theory is also important and relevant for your work if uh, if you're building tools and systems and if you're not doing empirical uh, research primarily because um, arguably the reasons why you're building a tool is not to build the tool per se, it's not to have the tool per se, but it's actually to test some underlying theory. And the tool is really sort of part of the experimental setup that's needed to, uh, to test that theory, to conduct your study. Um, or you're building a tool to develop a theory uh, that sort of emerges as you're exploring how people use the tool. Uh, or you're building a tool to explain your theory uh, so as a concrete instantiation of some uh, aspect of, of your theory. But either way, regardless of these, you're probably building a tool to do something with a theory. You're not so building a tool for the purpose of building a tool. So um, we'll stop here and I'll see you on uh, Thursday. And Again, my time management is disastrous. We'll talk about lit reviews on Thursday.